keep your head up no matter what. I heard that line so often as a child that I still hear it in my sleep. I've repeated it to colleagues, new acquaintances, even strangers. It was one of my mother's favorite expressions. It was a saying to motivate if needed and redirect if necessary. Keep your head up was never meant as a statement of false pride or arrogance. It was always one of Clarice's go to phrases in difficult moments, meant to reverse whatever circumstance was pulling us down. But honestly, it was hard for me to keep my head up with so much weighing me down. While I was loved and spoiled like the youngest child in many families, all that attention couldn't smooth over the deep flaws that I was hiding. Only my closest relatives, a few friends, and a teacher or two even knew I stuttered. But the big secret I couldn't read. That was top secret. Top secret. I was a phony, faking it, mouthing words in books that I did not really understand, hiding my secret from my teachers and my parents. One of my favorite songs of the late 1960s was Secret Agent Man. That was me, carrying what seemed to be one of the great secrets in the world. I could not read, yet no one seemed to notice. It was a distressful combination for a boy who had big dreams, illiterate and barely able to speak. I could read my name in a few simple words that I saw every day. It wasn't much, but for the time being, it was enough. I was also unfailingly polite. In public school, simply being polite all but guaranteed at least a passing grade in most classes. I was quiet and a good athlete. I was never first pick as a class project partner. But if it was stickball, football, or tag, Byron Pitts was a first round draft pick. All reasons enough for most teachers to leave me alone and for my peers to give me space. Most of my classes at Fort Worthington Elementary School, known simply as PS 85, were overcrowded. It's the same school my brother attended, and so in part I lived off his reputation. My brother was quiet, hardworking, and an average student. My mother was an active participant in parent activities. I was, in a sense, a legacy student, surviving at PS 85 on my family name. It was assumed I was learning just as Mac did. For a quiet child falling further and further behind, it was a good place to not get noticed. But I was performing well below average. In first and second grade, there was not a single A or B on my report card. My highest marks were always in behavior. My mother finally decided that the public school system was getting too big and impersonal for me. Because the discipline and attention offered in parochial school was much more appealing to her, in September of 1968, for third grade, she moved me to a Catholic school called St. Catherine's. It didn't matter where I went, school was work, difficult work. And so walking into St. Catherine's every morning felt like a job I wasn't good at and didn't enjoy. The school was a nondescript three story cement building surrounded by a cast iron fence on what seemed to be more like an alley than a street. There were row houses on three sides of St. Catherine's Church Building, which was later converted into a Baptist church as the neighborhood continued to change. Most of the teachers were nuns. They treated me well. The strict discipline only seemed like an extension of Clarice's rules. It was actually comforting being in a school where nearly everyone was afraid of breaking the rules. There were never any more than 12 to 15 kids in a class. Hardwood floors were polished to such a high sheen that you could even see a reflection. The place had a clean antiseptic smell. Giant windows were perfect for daydreaming about matters other than school. The boys wore uniforms, shirts, pants, and ties. The girls wore blue, gray, and white checked dresses. There was great emphasis on prayer and discipline. Reading, writing, and arithmetic seemed like second tier priorities. Most of my classmates came from working class homes, and many were raised by single parents. Despite our age, most of us seemed well aware that someone was sacrificing to send us to Catholic school. As usual, I became one of the less visible boys in class. My third grade teacher was Sister Clarice. I admit I had a crush on her. She was the prettiest nun in our school. But that was just about the highlight of my school experience. In this new environment, being polite was no longer enough to get by. I could not read and understand sentences, even simple ones. And the more difficult the work, the less I tried, the more easily I was distracted. We were required to read aloud at least once a week, and it was torture. Between the stammering and stuttering and mispronounced words, 
I was hard-pressed to do anything but hang my head in shame. The only relief I had was that I was bright enough to memorize just about anything read to me. At night during homework time, I would torture my family into helping me. A few tears every now and then would seal it. Since my sister was soon to be away at college, these after-dinner study sessions usually fell to my brother. Though our family lived in a three-bedroom home with a living room, dining room, kitchen, and almost finished basement, we spent most of our time in the kitchen. That's where homework was done. Perhaps that's why to this day I do my best thinking near food. And it was one of the early front lines in my secret battle to hide my reading problems. The two of us at the dinner table built for six. We sit across from each other, table covered with our books, two glasses of milk, buttered toast, or peanut butter sandwiches. Why buttered toast as an after-dinner homework snack, I have no clue, but it was what it was. Mac, help me, please, pretty please, I'd beg. I was never sure if it was because my brother loved me so much, hated my whining more, or simply feared my mother's reaction if he didn't help. But whatever his motivation, he suffered patiently. Okay, I'll read it to you one more time. Pay attention, he'd say, frustration wrinkling his forehead. Our study sessions could go on for three hours. Arithmetic, reading, spelling, history, it didn't matter the subject. Before the night was over, my brother would end up finishing my assignment, and I'd have sections memorized for class. In school the next day, when it came time to read aloud, I would have my section memorized. Sister Clarice took great pride in student involvement. Today we'll read Chapter 3, she'd say. Hands would shoot up. The smarter students would always go first. That was usually Pauline Tobias. I may have had a crush on her, too, but I know I always marveled at how she could read anything and seem to know everything. She could read like a church elder. I'd wait around for the hands to thin out, wait for the reading to get closer to the paragraph I'd memorized. Sister, sister, please, please call me, I'd plead. It usually worked. Passage read. My mind was now free to wander. There would be a price to pay later, of course, but why suffer today what could be put off until tomorrow? As long as no one found out, I thought I was safe. At the time, the word illiterate wasn't known to me. I thought I was just stupid. Who could I tell? I adored my mother but couldn't disappoint her. My siblings already thought I was both spoiled and a geek. Better to find new ways to hide.